It's a, a great pleasure and a privilege for me this evening to be uh, here with Fred Smith talking about uh, his uh, new book, The Dust of Uruzgan. Fred's a fascinating character. He's, uh, he's a diplomat, he's a singer-songwriter, he's, uh, he's uh, somebody who's got an extraordinary message for Australia. Um, and it's great that he's coming uh, to talk with us and to share with us with some songs as well later on, thankfully. We'll talk to his, talk to him into doing that for us. Thank you, Fred. Um, but here at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, we're, we're interested in strategic studies, we're interested in military affairs, Australia in the Asia Pacific, uh, and looking at defence issues broadly. Uh, and of course, this book, you'd think, well, The Dust of Aruzgan, it's very much a personal account, uh, Fred's personal journey, uh, but it is much more than that. It is, uh, and I've only just finished reading it last night, and I have to say, uh, it, it brought me to tears at a number of junctures, uh, and maybe I'm a bit of a sop, but I have to say it's a very moving account, very moving personal account of Fred's journey uh, through Aruzgan, uh, and relating that to us, uh, through Australians, everyday Australians, who maybe haven't had much, that much to do or haven't followed it all that closely, Fred really has brought to life this story. He's made, helped make it uh, understandable. Uh, but he's done that not just for soldiers and veterans. He's done it for family and friends. But, but more than that, we, we've got a story here that actually says something meaningful about the use of armed forces in, in modern society or the application of the armed forces of modern societies in primitive contexts, if you like. Uh, uh, or certainly much less sophisticated uh, technologically uh, uh, ones that we, we, we find ourselves in places like Afghanistan. So uh, it's uh, a really uh, a great privilege to, to have Fred with us tonight. Uh, Fred is, uh, you know, he's known uh, in many circles as a singer, songwriter, but this book really demonstrates that he's much more than that. Uh, this is a compelling read, but it uh, brings together and it brings to life the songs that some of us now know quite well. He, he provides wonderful context for uh, those songs, how they came about, uh, what it is that make, made them so uh, important for him to write. Uh, and so what we're going to have now is Fred's going to talk to us uh, for 30 or 40 minutes or so uh, about his experience, the journey behind the dust of Aruzgan. And then we're going to open up to Q&A. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll have a Bit, bit of back to and fro on it, and then we'll open up to the floor for your questions and your engagement with Fred on the issues that he grapples with so masterfully in this book. So, Fred, thank you very much, and over to you now. Thank, thank you. you very much for your kind words. How are you going? Can you hear me? <laughs> well, I, the, I can see across the room there are people who know all about Afghanistan and probably some people who don't know much about it at all. So I thought I'd start with a sort of basic level of Afghan history and uh, to explain <coughs> how we all came to be there in the first place. I mean, uh, many of us would have first have heard of Afghanistan during the uh, Russian years, of course, where they famously went in back in 1979, it? dominated for 10 years, were resisted by the Mujahideen, who are very often supported by the CIA quite successfully. And then they left, and when they left, when, when the Russians left in uh, 89, they left a power vacuum. Um, and what you get in the power vacuums is you get warlords and militias. And in, the, in, in those years between 89 and 96, which the Afghans refer to as the Civil War, the militias slugged it out with one another, led by their respective warlords, mostly along tribal lines, for control of the country. And the capital, Kabul in particular, which was hammered by rockets, with rockets coming into different enclaves. And in this sort of power vacuum, the, the civil war years, the disruption, created an environment in which the Taliban were able to gain support. And so they swept into the streets of Kabul in 1996 in the back of Toyota Hiluxes and took over the city. Uh, many thought at the time that, that uh, you know, the Taliban were a fairly extreme interpretation of the Islamic faith, but they represented the possibility of law and order, so people generally supported them. And so the Taliban 
dominated about 90% of Afghanistan for the following five years. There was a pocket of resistance in the north held by a militia called the Northern Alliance, led by a charismatic warlord named Shah Ahmed Massoud. Massoud interestingly predicted that al-Qaeda would attack the Western world from a base in Afghanistan. Um, and on the 9th of September 2001, Massoud accepted a request for an interview from two journalists who claimed from be, to be from the Al Jazeera network. But when they showed up, they turned out to be from the Al-Qaeda Al Al network. The camera they carried was a bomb. Massoud was killed, and two days later, the event he had predicted, an attack on the Western world took place in Manhattan and changed things forever. John Howard was in Washington at the time. He invoked the ANZUS Alliance eight days later, and we sent Australian Special Forces in to work alongside American and British Special Forces to drive the Taliban out. And in November 2001, talks were held in Germany to find a political solution. So where was Uruzgan province in this? Well, Uruzgan province is, is, is a fairly obscure province in southern Afghanistan. Uh, I've talked to Afghans who actually don't know where it is, uh, including the interpreters who said, yes, I, I, knew, I know where it is because it was the answer in my geography test. You know, you could get a good mark by knowing where Uruzgan was. But it's down there in the south, north of Kandahar and east of Helmand. So although it is quite obscure, it plays an important role in this story, in particular in the ascension of Hamid Karzai. Karzai was in Pakistan at the time. And uh, the West was essentially looking for a Pashtun tribal leader who could emerge to lead the country. The Pashtuns represent 42% of the population of Afghanistan, so they're the largest ethnic group. It was natural that we would need a Pashtun leader. So Karzai rolled the dice. He got on a motorbike and rode to Uruzgan province just to try and start something up on spec. He found some support amongst tribal leaders, but the Taliban there, got on his case and chased him into the mountains of Darawood. Uh, he was about to get captured when he got the satellite phone, called the CIA, they sent a helicopter, pulled him out, saved his life. He went back in a couple of weeks later, but this time he took some US Special Forces with him, and they started training up Afghan leaders around Darawood. But then they'd found out that the local people in Tarankout, the capital, provincial capital of, T of, of Uruzgan, had staged their own coup and got rid of the Taliban mayor. They saw the opportunity, they went, into the, they went down to Tarankot and took over the governor's compound. The Taliban headquarters in Kandahar heard about this and said this is not on. So they formed up a large convoy of about 80 trucks and set off up the road one afternoon to deal with this uprising in Tarankot. This is when the Taliban still dominated the south. They stopped at a village halfway, because it was Ramadan, they needed to eat. They could have gone on and taken TK in the, by dawn, but they decided to rest for the night, figuring they had the numbers anyway. This gave the US Special Forces the opportunity to call in airstrikes, and the following morning as the Taliban convoy went across the plains to the south of Tarankout, US Air came in and hammered it. Fighter planes, bombers, just destroyed the convoy. And this turned the war, because the Taliban realized that they could not mass in numbers Word of this got back to Kandahar. Taliban and Kandahar fled to Pakistan. Karzai swept south, took Kandahar, and went from there to become the, the, the president of Afghanistan. So it's an interesting story about the role of Uruzgan in Afghan recent history. It's an interesting story about the power of airstrikes to prevent the Taliban from massing. It's an interesting story about how useful a handful of special forces can be in this situation. But it's also a story about the importance of momentum. Afghans are survivors. They want to know what's going to happen next, and they want to be on the right side of history because the consequence of being on the wrong side of history, uh, it can affect your life expectancy. So that's how Uruzgan fits into this initial story. Um, and you have an interesting situation now where the Taliban were A, on the nose because they'd stuffed up while they were leading the country, the droughts, poverty, uh, uh, and crazy restrictions on people's liberty, they failed as a government. But also, people realized that they were on the losing side of history. So the Taliban were the pariahs at this point. You're talking 2001. 
We, Australia, pulled out, of, uh, pulled out of Special Forces in 2002. And then you have this sort of period between 2002 and 2005 where there was a great deal of optimism on the one hand, but on the other hand, the Taliban managed to pull off a resurgence in this period. Uh, I guess the interesting thing to note is that the, the Bush administration's official line was, we don't do nation building. Uh, they just didn't want to do that, they just don't want to do counter-terrorism. But the problem is, if you don't do nation building, then you're going to be playing whack-a-mole for the next century. Another part of this problem was that such government as existed was, according to the counts of many, commandeered by particular interests and warlords. And so police, the government, were used by the, some of the warlords in certain areas to advance their professional interests to prosecute and persecute antagonistic tribes. And of course, this alienated people from what called itself the government. The warlords were a big feature of this. Um, perhaps many argue, people like uh, Anand Gopal, Sarah Chayas argue that the, that the American Marines and Special Forces that remained in, in, in Afghanistan in small numbers contributed this in a way. They were, uh, their approach was essentially to, to define and pursue the enemy. But in pursuing the enemy, they had to seek advice from the people they knew, who were the warlords. And of course, in identifying who the Taliban was, the warlords would identify their enemy. So, um, and apart from all that, there was a clear absence of any effort to reintegrate the Taliban. And so many Taliban found themselves, or, or former Taliban, for who wanted to join the government, found themselves with no way back into the government because they were being chased by what was left, what was, what was the government, uh, being prosecuted by the warlords, and so they had no choice but to seek the protection and company of the Taliban. And so for all these reasons, the Taliban had made a resurgence. And this is sort of highlights some of the limitations of airstrikes and of special forces. They're good at breaking stuff, but asking them to build stuff is a bit beyond their training. So that's the sort of general background to the situation in 2006 where uh, the international community having got quite involved in Iraq and with the US very heavily engaged in Iraq, uh, the international community was called on to send in more troops to the various provinces of Afghanistan of which there are 34. And so the international community agreed to do this. They saw the need to, re to reinforce security in Afghanistan. The Taliban had resurged. They were strong, particularly in the south and in some provinces in the east. The south, of course, is Pashtun country, and that is where their natural constituency is. And so different nations took on different provinces as part of a sensible enough international division of labor. The Brits went to Helmand province in the southwest. The Canadians took on Kandahar. The Germans went on to Kunduz, for example. The Kiwis went to Bamiyan. And the Dutch agreed to take on a small province in the south called Uruzgan. <coughs> so I wanted to offer an account of how we came to be in Uruzgan, because I don't think uh, that's been examined very carefully. And I, and I, I took the liberty of quoting um, someone who was the Secretary of Defense at the time, who said, by mid-2005, with the Taliban resurgent, ISAF coalition members have begun deploying forces and aid teams to key provinces. The UK, Germany, France, Denmark, Canada, and New Zealand, among others, had joined the United States in the field, so the Netherlands and Australia began to consider what we should do as members of this coalition. It wasn't so much a matter of direct pressure from the United States or NATO, more a judgment that as members of a community with a continuing shared interest in Afghanistan, we needed to join the others to do more to help the challenge. The Dutch were prepared to accept leadership of a province but wanted a tier one partner to share the load. 
Australia was still in Iraq and with the ADF and civilian agencies now in Solomons as well, we didn't want to take on a province of our own, but we were prepared to join a tier one country. And so with the Brits and Americans encouraging the union, the Afghan government pleased to have another base covered. The Netherlands and Australia found each other in wedlock in Uruzgek. So it's an interesting sort of a, a story about the sort of historical accidents, the coalition and alliance considerations that saw us get into this small province in the south of Uruzgan. But once, of course, the military went in, we developed a political and economic, a political and, and emotional equity in Uruzgan province. So it's an interesting story about how the military, the equity follows the military. And so we sent in 300 engineers focused on uh, building schools, roads, hospitals, in support of a large Dutch contingent. And the Dutch were the predominant force on the base for the next four years. They were the lead province. They had 2,000 soldiers. They had a thing called the Provincial Reconstruction Team to do all the tribal work. And they took an approach that they called the 3D approach, defense, diplomacy, and development. And they had a special PowerPoint briefing. If you were caught in the vicinity, you would be sat down and subjected to this PowerPoint briefing <laughs> on the 3D approach. Um, they could be didactic, the Dutch, but on the other hand, they had a good story to tell because they were four years ahead of the ISAF strategy, which eventually reached this point by about 2009. Also on the base were Australian Special Forces. And during this period of four years, the Australian involvement evolved from what a thing called the Reconstruction Task Force, focused on engineering tasks, to the Mentoring and Reconstruction Task Force, focused on mentoring and rebuilding to the mentoring task force with a focus on rebuilding the fourth Kandak of the Afghan National Army in order to be in a position to hand over to them the security problems. At the same time there were US Special Forces elements who'd been there since 2002 um, in small numbers, probably about 200 of them, down at a forward operating base on the main base there called Ripley, but also out at peripheral districts of Kalzuruzgan and um, Chachane uh, in small fire bases out there. So an interesting coalition mix there, but the Dutch were predominant. Now, so you can see with these different elements on the base, there was always the possibility of people seeing things differently, including on the very fundamental question of what to do about the main warlords in the province and on the very fundamental question about what to do with the tribes. Now the US Special Forces had been there as I said since 2002. In that year, President Karzai had appointed a, a warlord by the name of Jean Mohammed Khan to be the governor of Uruzgan. Jean Mohammed Khan was from the Popolzai tribe. Popolzai are dominant in Tarankout and the areas around it, but they only represent 10% of the population of Uruzgan, the rest of which were Barakzai, Nurzai, Gilzai. But because Karzai was Popolzai and, and connected to JMK, JMK was appointed. And so the US Special Forces worked with JMK, Jean Mohammed Khan, because he was the governor and because that was who they knew. Later, they began to work with Matula Khan who was a sort of henchman for Jean Mohammed Khan and probably perpetrated a lot of atrocities in his name against the other tribes in that period between 2002 and 2005. But Matula had a very good militia. They were disciplined, well paid, well fed. So they were useful partners for the US Special Forces in those three years. Now the Dutch arrived in 2006. And before they set to work, they did an odd thing. They commissioned some research <laughs> in order to work out what was going on. Uh, and, a, and, a, and a research company called the TLO, the liaison officer, did some research in Durasgan and the question of why some of the tribes beyond Tarankat were supporting the Taliban. And of course, the answer was that they needed protection. 
and feared the government of Jean Mohammed Khan. And so the Dutch developed what they called the tribal balance policy. They eschewed all contact <coughs> with Jan Mohammed Khan and Matula Khan, and they worked very closely with the other tribes, the Barakzai tribe, the Gilzai tribe, the Nurzai, out in the districts of Uruzgan, actively supporting them. So what you essentially had was two conflicting tribal political strategies going on between the US and the Dutch. Paradoxically, that was not a bad outcome because it enabled us to do a very Afghan thing, which was to play both sides. <laughs> 2009, enter Fred Smith. International community realized we needed to send diplomats in in bigger numbers. Why? Well, the broader strategy had shift to counterinsurgency, a focus on protecting the population and winning the support of the population as against smoting the enemy. It was realized that political solutions were essential. Without them, this would go on forever. And besides which, diplomats provide an important source of advice to government. I remember reading a quote by uh, the British High Ambassador at the time who said, in order to be successful, military leaders need to be unquestionably optimistic and somewhat susceptible to groupthink. The point is, if you're a military leader, commander or whatever, you can't have doubts. You can't send people in the battle if you have doubts about what you're doing. Diplomats need to come in to offer a second point of view on the situation to government. For example, Gallipoli, early reports that went back to the Prime Minister were, yeah, we'll be right, just send more troops. That's what the military will generally say because they have to believe in what they're doing. Government needs an alternative source of advice. So I went in with an ambivalent view about, well not ambivalent, but I wasn't sure about the Afghanistan mission. I was open-minded about it, let's just say. And when I got there, I took advantage of the depth of knowledge that the Dutch had developed. You know, they had a lot of soldiers there, but the Dutch had done a good job of cultivating their, ex, their Afghan expatriate community back in Holland, of which there are many. And so they had a real depth of expertise, both amongst Afghans and amongst academics, one of whom was a Dutchman named Willem, who had come out of a Dutch museum. Uh, you know, he had sort of haircut beetles circa 1964, and he got around in socks and sandals. He was known to the Dutch soldiers as Geiten, Geiten Woolen Sockendrager, <laughs> which means wearer of goat hair socks. <laughs> But anyway, he knew a lot about the Afghans, and I used to sit down and just <coughs> absorb the knowledge. And he said, look, he, he kicked around in the Mujahideen in 1984. He said, look, the population back then was 15 million. It's now 30 million. Competition for land and resources is extreme. Competition between these tribes. And of course, they'd been through 30 years of war. And so we entered these situations thinking we're here to defeat insurgents or smoke terrorists, but of course, through the eyes of the locals, we are a source of power resor and resources in their struggles with one another. This means we need to be very aware of this. And this means probably three things. Firstly, that when we take in, okay, there's no data in a scan. No one collects data or information. There's no one there with a clipboard. All that you know about the province comes from what people tell you. You get perceptions. Now, if you're talking to only one people or one group, you're going to get a skewed view. They will tell you what they want you to think in order, in the context of their dispute with a guy in the next trial. That means you need to filter, synthesize, and triangulate information in order to get a broad picture of what's going on. Secondly, it means that every decision you make as an intervening force is political. It will increase one person's wealth, prosperity, power against another. You need to understand that and accordingly you need to make these decisions with political strategy in mind. So that was the fundamental lesson for me from talking to the Dutch. Another aspect of the Dutch involvement was 
for better and worse, an important and interesting thing about the Afghanistan thing is the influence of home domestic politics. And this is in part why the Dutch took this very development political view, because the war was abhorrent to many Dutch. They would, didn't like the idea of going in, an, in, in, in a kinetic war. They wanted, to be, they wanted more to feel good. The Dutch like to think of themselves as good people, and they are. Um, it also shaped their development projects. They went for what they called eye-catching deliverables, big things that could be presented on the home front quite well. Meanwhile, they had a lot of under the un, sort of back quiet projects going on in districts where they would, you know, a farmer would come in the middle of the night from the Mirabad Valley, they'd slip him a grand worth of cash, he'd go out and dig a well, all this stuff to build relations. So they did high profile stuff and they did really low profile community and relation building stuff. Interesting approach. Um, of course, a part of the Dutch approach to the warlords was that they wanted to seem back home holier than the Pope, as one Dutchman put it to me. The optics of dealing with warlords is not good on it. I mean, you need to deal with the warlords. They're part of the power structure, but they eschewed all contact partly to, for the presentational purposes. And of course, the other thing about this was uncertainty about the Dutch mission. Dutch politics, as you may be aware, is very complicated. There are six main political parties. Their lower house looks like our upper house now, like you know the bar scene from Star Wars. Highly contested, <laughs> highly contested around the Dutch mission. Very controversial. Uh, you know, three of those parties supported the mission, three didn't. Um, and come March 2010, the matter of their, they had a four-year tenure for their mission, and it was about to expire in August 2010. Uh, it came down to the crunch point. By March 2010, they still hadn't decided what to do. This matters because military planning requires a great deal more foresight than that. They had 17 cabinet meetings in a row to try and resolve what to do about the, the Dutch mission there. They failed to reach a point of agreement, and the cabinet and Dutch government disintegrated. Dutch government fell over the Uruzgan mission. They couldn't resolve the decision about whether to go back in. Uh, they called an election. And the Uruzgan, Dutch Uruzgan mission ran out of its tenure. It expired, effectively. And so the Dutch were, were to go home in August 2010. OK, so we knew that the Dutch were going to leave. And word of this got out into Uruzgan province, <coughs> which created a great deal of anxiety. Because many of those tribes that I mentioned before, the Nurzai, Gilzai, Barakzai, had come to trust and rely on the Dutch and were fearful that if they left, that they would be abandoned. It could be my mother. <laughs> and so in the, in the face of this anxiety, I mean, two, two decisions had to be made. Australia had to decide what it was going to do. Uh, and what we in Vietnam decided, we decided not to take over leadership of Uruzgan province. We decided to leave that role to the Americans. But what, what we decided to do was take over the provincial reconstruction team, which was that aspect, that team within the, within the military base that dealt with governors and the tribal leaders and did the development work. So an Australian diplomat by the name of Bernard Phillip was chosen to lead a US-Australian PRT beginning August 2010. Uh, that comprised Aussie officers, about five or six of them, five or six of us DFAT, um, and then a team of American soldiers in support, and the Australian Managed Works team as well. So we were going to take over leadership of this province. Now, up until this point, Australia had just been focused on mentoring the army, Afghan army. So we were, in a sense, we had been up until that point innocent of all these tribal considerations. We'd narrowed our focus to the Afghan National Army, so we didn't have to make decisions about what to do with warlords and tribes. But with the Dutch about to leave, we had to make these decisions. And we had to signal these decisions to the Afghan public because the Taliban were making propaganda about what would happen once the Dutch left. So at that point, this was March 2010. It was me on the ground uh, for DFAT. And, um, and we had to make a call on this, you know. So I did a bit of research and um, 
spoke to a few people. I spoke to Jason Katz. He was an American aid worker there, had been there for some time. He put it in simple terms. He said, I guess you've got two choices. You could either you could either keep the balance that the Dutch have left, or you could let MK rule. Now, the MK rule option was not as dumb as it sounds. Matula Khan was developing as a leader. He'd sort of moved from henchman to warlord to more, uh, to more statesman-like figure. He was running shuras in town, for example, where some barracks and Gilzai leaders would come and meet and resolve problems and answer cases. My American colleague, Russ, went to one of these cool shuras and said, this is governance Afghan style. People go to MK for governors, not, for the, not to the governor. So you're seeing really here an alternative source of what we call governance. I mean, he had a point in a country where formal government is weak and often corrupt and sometimes partisan. What constituted legitimate was in the eye of the beholder. And even people like the TLO felt that we could deal with Matula because he was you know, more mature than, say, Jean Mohammed Khan. And in any case, all the money that he embezzled or, or, or otherwise secured stayed in the province because he was a local guy. <laughs> anyway, I also conducted a series of meetings with, around the province with various leaders, including Mullah Dad, a Kuchi leader who had no front teeth but a real genial disposition. And he, um, he said to me, Talk to people, organise shuras, have good relations with tribal leaders, bring development, protect people against other groups like the Taliban and the old government of JMK. If you support all tribes, we will support you. So this seems sound to me. Clearly we needed a relationship with Matula, but we also needed a relationship with the other tribes. As I said, we needed to do a very Australian thing. We needed to be egalitarian and support all equally. But we also needed to do a very Afghan thing, which was to play both sides. So that's where it ended up. And we fixed on, fixed on a political strategy, which was to firstly engage and contain Matula Khan. That is to say, we talked to him. We related to him. We engaged with him intensely. But we made it clear what we expected and wanted from him. Now, can I say that we had him as a puppet on the string? No, it might have been the other way around. But he, he knew what we wanted to see. And that, at least, was a start. And there's good reasons to think that he matured into a more inclusive and statesmanlike figure. But, of course, in parallel with that, we engaged intensively with the other tribes in the province. Development projects, conversation, some level of therapy, I think. You know, we became a shrink in some ways. If they had a problem, they'd come and see us. Uh, and we even facilitated meetings between Matula and these other tribes to try and negotiate some better, better way forward. And at the same time, of course, we engaged and supported the provincial governor and his administration. Um, there were, you know, when we got there, there were five or six <coughs> provincial government departments. By the time we left, there were 24. And the governor became a more robust figure and uh, was empowered. Now, of course, the governor <laughs> and Matula didn't really get along. You know, Matula was a, by nature a monopolist, and, 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 he, and the governor was an alternative sense of power. That's the way it is there. So by supporting the governor, we were essentially <laughs> providing a ballast and support around the main warlord in the province. So. That was where things were at by the time we formed our political strategy. Now, when the Dutch pulled out in August of 2010, one of the consequences was that, of course, the PRT grew, but the Dutch had done a very good job not only of engaging in the provincial capital of Tarrant Cup, but also out in the districts of Darawood and Chora. Um, Afghanistan, a highly decentralised country, if you want to be effective in Afghanistan, it doesn't suffice to engage in the capitals. You need to get out into the districts. And the Dutch had mission teams doing political and development work in Darawit district and up in Chora. Uh, and so we needed to replace this mission team capacity. And so I was sent up to forward operating base Mealwise in the Chora Valley, 40 kilometers north of Tarankout, in August of 2010 with a team of American shooters for protection to do that district engagement team. Um, and I just wanted to offer some sort of perspectives from the districts because 
this is really the grassroots stuff. Uh, all that you might have heard about the, the strategic political stuff can be put in perspective by this very grassroots sort of experience that I, that I had. And I suppose I, I just want to tell a story which, from my book which, um, which, which makes a point in all this. Um, you know, as I said, I had a team of American shooters who worked within the PRT, but the Americans had also sent, it was mainly an Australian base, perhaps 80 Australians up at Ford Operating Base Mirwais, perhaps uh, 200 Afghan soldiers were there, but then we sent up a team of Americans with me, and then a separate team of Americans with a police mentoring team to mentor the local police in, in Shura District. Um, one evening, the police mentoring team lieutenant asked Willie, that was my lieutenant, for a loan of five of our PRT soldiers for patrol to Kala Kala the next day. I said to Willie it was a US Army resource, it was his call to make, and Willie gave him the green light. The guys were keen, they were probably sick of escorting me around and wanted to get some real action. I was working at the PRT office the following morning at 1100 hours when the sergeant, our civil affairs sergeant, Gary burst in, highly excited. They just got into a tick, a contact, and were buzzing with adrenaline. They'd been to a place called Kalia Rag to do some atmospherics testing. They said they'd met a local national who told them things are fine here. Malam Sadiq and his guys keep things pretty quiet. But if you walk five minutes that way and cross the aqueduct, you'll get shot at. Soldiers being soldiers, they walked five minutes that way, <laughs> crossed the aqueduct, and got shot at. <laughs> Gary came back and explained, the whole hillside across the river lit up in muzzle flashes from 200 yards. Man, we were around zipping and fizzing around us. We had no cover, so we ran behind a hill and returned fire. Then we went back into a flanking maneuver and got closer. Then we shot again, so we fired back. Like, I mean, we raked that whole goddamn hill with gunfire. Then we went after him, but they ran away. <laughs> I've never seen him so happy. <laughs> what this says is that security in Uruzgan is a function of meters. You cross an aqueduct and you're in trouble. Um, so what we learned from this is that the key to security in the Jura district was three local leaders, three guys, one of them Malam Sadiq, Akhtar Muhammad, Muhammad Akhtar Khan, Mac, we reduced the Afghans to acronyms too. <laughs> And these guys had militias of 20, 30, 40 guys with AKs, and they kept the area pretty secure. Eight kilometres south in the Baluchi Valley around Kop Mashal, the guys there used to get into contacts four out of five times they went out the gate. But where we were, we could walk through the village. Okay, so, so this is interesting. Security is a function of local leadership, and that meant that the Taliban had a couple of tactics, one of which was to kill local leaders. In fact, the Taliban senior leadership put out a proclamation in, in August that year saying it was okay for Taliban to kill local leaders. They'd been doing it already up to that point, but with mixed feelings. <laughs> um, and the second thing with the Taliban, of course, was their use of IEDs. If it came down to a, a gunfight between us and them, we would win. And so they took to you know, what they call asymmetric warfare. They laid these IED bombs around to impede our freedom of movement, to impede the movement of our vehicles and our foot patrols and make life difficult for us. But of course the other aim of the IEDs was to target the local, the press in Australia or in the United States to kill local lead, kill us in sufficient numbers to undermine the will of our political leaders to prosecute the fight. I mean, the Taliban have a saying, a small bomb in Kabul is worth two in the districts. Why? Because that's where the foreign journalists are. IEDs are political, as well as tactical. So what was our tactics all this out at the Ford operating bases? Well, firstly, you know, our military tactics focused around, um, focused around really uh, patrols with the Afghan National Army. And the focus of those patrols varied. It could be to assert control of a territory. It could be to seek out weapons caches intelligence-led patrols to identify weapons, caches, and often they'd find, you know, heaps of stuff and grab it and destroy it. And that, of course, would undermine the Taliban's ability to fight. Um, also engagement patrols, and then, you know, I had my own sort of uh, trips outside the wire to build relationships, start development projects and things like that. 
Um, and so, to pull, and of course, then the second thing was to develop the Afghan National Army. There were 200 soldiers on the base, uh, and, and the role was to develop them, their ability to patrol and fight. Now, most of those Afghan National Army guys were Tajiks and Uzbeks and were not particularly comfortable in southern Afghanistan <laughs> and not that keen to lay down their life for a bunch of Pashtuns. But, you know, we had to do what we had to do to get them outside the wire. And in the end, you know, the colonel there was good. The intelligence officer was a great guy. We had a very strong relationship. And they were pretty effective in the end in securing the area. But in terms of the political agenda, you know, what we needed to do was support local leaders, including the district chief, Muhammad Daoud Khan. So that's the view from the forward operating bases. And I came back from the FOBs in about September, October of 2010 and did another three months in the province, then came back to Australia. And stayed in Australia for a couple of years, produced the Dust of Uruzgan album, <coughs> toured it around the country. And in that meantime, there were some very positive developments, I think. You know, the PRT got to a critical mass, got a lot of development, government work going. And some great projects. We finished the TK to Chora Road. Uh, of all the things we did in Afghanistan, the Afghans love the roads the most. Um, no one likes potholes. And of course, the roads endure. We built a number of schools, including the Malalai Girls School uh, in Tarankau, which had 700 girls going to it. Afghans, on the whole, want to educate their daughters. So those were some of the achievements. Uh, the Mirabad Valley, we secured that from, from pretty much Taliban country in 2009 to a point where we dominated it and were getting roads and schools out there. Uh, and, and I suppose those development projects were part of the incentive. You know, we were trying to cultivate the support of local leaders. Our comparative advantage over the Taliban is that we could bring them things they wanted. Projects, schools, roads. Uh, whereas the Taliban's main strength was laying in intimidation. And so the, the leaders of the Mirabad Valley out to the, out to the east there encouraged us and, and invited us in. And over the four-year period, uh, became very secure. Now, there were a couple of setbacks in that period, a number of green on blue incidents, which I won't go into, but uh, obviously devastating for Australian troops um, to, be, to be targeted by the people we're trying to mentor, the Afghan National Army. It was only rogue elements, but one or two can spoil... Uh, can spoil the relationship and, and, and the perceptions back home, more to the point. Again, Australian soldiers were the immediate target, but the home audience is a big part of the Taliban's target. Secondly, uh, my good friend Mohammed Dawood Khan was assassinated at one point, and linked to that probably was the assassination of the original warlord, Jan Mohammed Khan. In Kabul, incidentally, both were shot in Kabul in, 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 in attacks. Uh, circumstances unclear. Taliban probably involved in JMK's assassination, JMK's nephew possibly involved in MDK's assassination. Complex pictures, hard to understand what actually happened. But regardless, the consequence of all this was that Matula Khan was appointed as chief of police. Why? Because Karzai, in his tribal... Uh, Karzai's habits of government came from the old Afghanistan where what you do is, is it's, it's, a, it's a patronage network. So you have clients and patrons. And Karzai's model was to have a powerful patron working on his team in every province. That used to be Jean Mohammed Khan. Jean Mohammed Khan dies. He appoints Matula Khan. That was the natural thing to do. So Matula Khan became the chief of police, uh, which would have been the worst nightmare for the Dutch. And was actually not something that we did not, you know, we the PRT were not particularly comfortable or supportive of. We liked his predecessor much better. But the good news was that Matula turned out to be a good organiser of people, uh, for better or worse. Uh, his, uh, his, his management strategies would not suit APS standards, but, um, but were effective nonetheless. He understood punishment and reward. Um, and... Uh, and he was quite an effective organiser of the Afghan National Police. And in those intervening, in, intervening years, as Australian and, and American forces pushed out into the valleys of Uruzgan province, Matula and his guys set up a network of checkpoints along with the Afghan National Arm, Army through those valleys. Afghanistan people live in valleys, that's the way it is. And, and those checkpoints were doing a reasonable job of providing security. On the back of that security, 
uh, we, the PIT, were able to do development work. And so there was a certain amount of pr progress in that time. Uh, and then, in, and then uh, I suppose it must have been late 2012, uh, ISAF generally was beginning to withdraw from Afghanistan. And in accordance with the ISAF schedule, Australia had resolved we don't, incidentally, we'd taken over leadership of the province in late 2012 from the Americans. We agreed to do that. Um, so, um, so we decided late 2012 that we would withdraw from the province in October 2013. I, I realised that this would be my last opportunity to go over there. It was the kind of work I enjoyed. But also back here in Australia, I developed a role in telling the story about Oruzgan to Australian people and was enjoying that. So I thought I'd go and see how the story ended. And so I got back there in May 2013 for the last six months of the Afghan of the Uruzgan mission. Uh, um, I got involved in a, in, a, in a range of work. One thing I did was very focused on was the Tarankout airfield. This was personal to me because uh, they built it, you know the Americans wherever they go they pave things. Um, for example, when I arrived in Tarankout, it was all rocks on the ground, but they they built a whole bunch of footpaths in a project that we called OEF. Operation Enduring Footpath. <laughs> <laughs> but they paved the Tarankout airstrip, you see, and this made for a good cricket pitch. <laughs> but more importantly than that, the defining thing about Oruzgan province is its isolation. And we realised that if the airfield couldn't be sustained after we left, then Oruzgan would sink into isolation again, and all that we'd achieved with the National Army and all that we'd achieved in development would fall apart. So it became a priority to defend the air, you know, make sure the airstrip could be sustained. And, and I, can get, I got involved in, a, in, a, in work to do that, particularly by engaging, you know, Ministry of Transport and Dawa Oil and Cam Air and a whole bunch of things need to be glued together. And I did that working with a young, with a young, uh, a young fellow who'd come out to Australia uh, as an Afghan refugee, Hazara, and joined the Australian Air Force and was sent back there. So he understood airfields, he could speak both languages, and he glued this whole situation together in two months, <clears throat> which highlights the value of cultivating our expatriate communities to do this kind of work, something the Dutch did very well. Um, it's a story I tell uh, probably at too much length in the book. But this, and then, of course, there were ceremonies uh, to mark the final conclusion of the mission, a cessation of ceremony attended by those gentlemen from Australia, big deal but also a ceremony where we invited uh, the parents of Australian soldiers killed in Afghanistan to come and commemorate um, what they'd lost. Uh, and that was a very moving thing in November that year. But the other thing I did when I was there was, you know, I, I quite consciously at this stage wanted to be in a position of telling the story. And I think that one thing that's really lacking here in Australia, in a sense, is the Afghan account of us. I mean, what did they think of us? I mean, are we going to write our own report card or are we going to ask them? And so I uh, got my interpreter to call a dozen or so Afghans around the province and got them to come down the front gate. We met them there, brought them into PRT House, the meeting room there, plied them with water and asked them a series of questions. You know, have we made a difference? And I, and I filmed these and uh, here's some of that footage. <laughs> People were in huge trouble with the insurgents. Parts of their bodies were being cut off, like their ears and noses. People died while being tortured by the insurgents with the sticks and stones. Now people can relax. People can now feed their families through work, and our children have a very good life. Therefore, we have a very secure environment. Children saw the very bad times we had in the valley. Now they are more relaxed and do not have worries about the security. When I came in at the end of 2001 to Oruzgan province, there were only two health facilities. One was in Terankut, which was a very small facility with minimal resources and another was in Derawood. There were limited services in Uruzgan and not everyone could reach them. Now, 
there are 29 health facilities across the province that have good quality, reasonable amount of resources in 385 health posts. Since Australians came to our land, our province, Afghanistan, in Khasuruzgan, it is like we were sitting before in the darkness. Now we're sitting to the light. More construction work has happened in our province, our roads, ditches, and even our agriculture produce has improved in its output. People have seen the differences which have come about as a result of the efforts by our friends and our coalition partners, Australians. They have lost many sons here, and we are very sad for that, because they are our guests, and they were not supposed to die here. Now the Afghan National Security Forces have replaced the Australian in the patrol bases. People in the villages feel very happy about this. They understand that the international forces cannot stay here in Afghanistan forever. I appreciate the work of international forces in Afghanistan who help the people emerge from disaster to prosperity, particularly here in Uruzgan, where I appreciate the efforts of coalition here is a consequence of which we now have a better environment. The blood that has been sacrificed by coalition forces here for the poor people of this province won't be forgotten. So, I mean, those, those are sort of interesting and heartening uh, perspectives. Uh, there's a couple of others that I'd share with you. Um, Colonel Hanif, who was the, the fierce and inscrutable chief prosecutor, praised the aggression of Australian soldiers, as a result of which there were fewer places in the province where insurgents could hide. I mean, that's interesting. Uh, the reality is that the Afghans wanted aggression from us. They wanted us to be very proactive in chasing the Taliban out of their lives. Uh, Hanif said that Australians and Dutch had done well to promote balance between tribes, although the Afghan government had not always been helpful in this. Uh, Haji Ramatullah, the Popozai tribal leader and former director of education, offered some interesting big picture perspectives. He listed the five main things the international community had achieved in Afghanistan. Highways and roads, a viable education department, the development of systematic and organised government after years of chaos, a vast improvement in security, and the, and the establishment of basic elements of a modern economy, a stable currency, a mobile phone system, and the introduction of the internet to Afghanistan thing. All of these were big achievements after 40 years of war. Ramatullah said IFSAF's main mistakes were civilian casualty incidents, airstrikes gone wrong, and situations where innocent people had been attacked based on wrong information that political dynamic I mentioned earlier. People understand these sort of mistakes are, make, are made in war, quote, but this has been the main loss of support for ISAF amongst Afghans. So that's sort of a bit of a report card on, on the broader mission and, um, and, and what it was all about. I've, I've bogarted the mic a bit here, which is sort of it was going to be a conversation, but I, I got carried away on my computer this morning. And, and I've inflicted death by PowerPoint on you all. Um, I suppose we could have a look at the current situation, then move to some questions. Yeah, well, I think it'd be good to um, just talk about a couple of the aspects. I mean, one of the things that strikes me about the book is, you know, and I've touched on this at the start, is that you bring together the personal and the political. You, you provide a context that m helps uh, make sense of what is otherwise a nonsensical uh, conflict and you help provide context uh, to not quite explain away but help people understand how it is that those Australians died doing what they did in a risk game. Uh, and your songs uh, very powerfully capture that and uh, it struck me as I was reading the book, uh, you know, the, 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 the dealing with the grief, and, and it comes out when you talk about the dust of Aruskan and Sapper's lullaby, and um, I, I was really touched with the way you dealt with the parents uh, when they came uh, 
when they came to concerts that you were performing at here in Australia, uh, when they met you uh, in Aruzga, when a couple of the parents, uh, one of the sappers' dads came and saw you and you recognised the, the name. Um, so the, the, you deal with the grief there uh, uh, in a way that I think is very, very important. It's important, and, and you, you talk about it in the book at the end there, about mates for mates and soldier on. Um, we, we, most of us have, uh, have been very much removed from that. That's partly because of the, the, the fact that the media has, was kept away from the action. It was very much a, a controlled war. And that, this gets back to the political dimension, um, which you, you've talked about extensively as well. But you talk about the Australian political strategic objectives being, firstly, the support of the alliance, and secondly, the fight, fight against terrorism by strengthening the Afghan government against harbouring terrorists. Of course, that's, that's, the, that's the difficult one. That's the one that, that generates all the casualties. Trying to do good uh, generates extraordinary backlash from those who are being pushed back. Um, and uh, you asked the question early on in the book, to, on page 288, I think it was, uh, so Jenny Renato, Benny Renato's mum, asks you, are we making a difference? Um, you, you've portrayed uh, an account that, that suggests we, we, we did make a difference, we have made a difference. Um, but do you want to reflect, uh, you know, two years later now, what's your sense of the prognosis? Where, where are things heading? Uh, in a risk and more broadly. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's an important question. How enduring was the difference we made? And, and, and the short answer is that, you know, there has been some regression since... Uh, mm. We didn't expect it. we didn't expect all that we'd done to be resilient, but I think uh, we left it in better shape than we found it, and, and some of those, some of that resilience has remained. Um, um, uh, in terms of, uh, I suppose, in terms of Afghanistan broadly, um, the situation is currently better than we thought it would be. You know, over the last three years, 125 ISAF troops, 1,000 Afghan soldiers have pulled out. That's a big change. We're down to 10,000 American troops and, and a handful of ISAF troops. You know, the Taliban expected to overrun the situation. That, that hasn't happened at all. Uh, the Taliban currently holds more territory than it ever has, but they're only covering 3 to 5% of the population. Um, there were more violent deaths in Afghanistan last year than there have been since 2000. We're talking about 3,000 a year or so, according to UN figures, which is not good, but it's not as bad as a place like South Africa or Colombia that are notionally at peace. So the situation in the security is undoubtedly bad, but it has not fallen apart. It's not Syria, for example. Um, uh, the politics, you know, seems to be, they seem to be finding an accord. It's, it's ugly, but they seem to be moving forward. But the key, the key point is that the Taliban has about 30,000 soldiers in Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, the Afghan National Army has now about 300,000. Yeah. So what that means is the Taliban can effectively swarm and attack places, but they can't hold places. Um, uh, the Taliban won't win, but they won't lose either. And so the likely prognosis is an ongoing sort of insurgency uh, with all the problems that causes and all the, 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 the barrier that creates to any economic development. Um, but that, I think, that sort of, that is better that for most Afghans would see that as better than, than what would happen if we pulled out, which I think would be uh, some entropy and collapse uh, um, and possibly a disintegration, uh, and with that disintegration would become, you know, increased possibilities of al-Qaeda operations from there, but also massive refugees flows, um, which the world is already struggling with. So for all these reasons, um, uh, I think we need to do what we're doing now, which is bring the, bring the international involvement down to a sustainable level, around 10,000 troops, American troops, and then sustain it. Yeah, and to 270 Australians, and we, we contribute to that, and I think that that will suffice to see, you know, we're, we're sort of natural believers in progress, but I think in Afghanistan we have to accept that if we can just hold the line for a while, 
then we'll see what the next generation can do. 75% uh, of Afghans are under the age of 25. They want iPhones. Yeah. They don't want this tribal crap. They want iPhones and jobs. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's the hope for the future. Um, so, you know, 10,000 US troops, well, they've had 30,000 on the Korean Peninsula since 1950. 10,000 is not a big deal. Obama wanted to pull troops out of Afghanistan for political reasons. I think he's been persuaded that that's a bad idea. Uh, and I think uh, whatever administration, well, if Trump comes in, then all bets are off. But, um, but I think his successes, if they're Democrats, will, will sustain it at that level. And I think we just need to sustain it and signal that we're going to sustain it. Because that sends signals to the Taliban, to the Afghan people, that uh, the Taliban won't win, and that affects the calculus. Yeah. That we affects were, the calculus. We were talking offline before about um, the, the nature of the conflict there and, and the prospects. And uh, uh, I was, we were talking about the fact that I was heartened by your account. I mean, I've, I've defended uh, Australia's involvement in Afghanistan and been critical of our return to Iraq. But my sense is that you know, we, we've invested enormously in blood and treasure in Afghanistan. We kind of owe it uh, to the people there and to our own who've come back to follow through. And you, you make the point there that uh, uh, near the end you talk about stalemate is better than the alternative. And, and I think that's an important point. That, that, uh, and uh, it, it, for me, it, it kind of it, uh, it resonated as, 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 a, as, a, as a valid point, you know, as we think about uh, given that in the grand scheme of things in the world today, things aren't what they were in 2001. The, the, our neck of the woods is much more problematic, not just because of the rise of China, but with climate change and a range of other uh, socio-political and ge you know, geostrategic factors in our neck of the woods that makes uh, it appropriate for us to think more and focus more on our neck of the woods. But there still is probably you know, a, a residual capacity to press on and continue in Afghanistan, as you suggest. Uh, but, you know, th this, is, this is obviously a debatable point, and I think at this point it's probably worth opening up to the audience uh, and engaging them, because I'm sure there are strong views, one way or the other, on this uh, from people. Um, and what we might do, Fred, is uh, I will grab the microphone uh, and I will uh, uh, see who has a question they'd like to ask, uh, and then... Uh, and then uh, take the microphone to them for a couple of questions because we do want to get a couple of songs in uh, and we don't want to miss the opportunity to hear you, hear you, um, hear you uh, perform for us. So uh, let me see if I can do that and if I can see if there's any, anybody with a question out there. I'll tell you what, I'll give you my mic. That's not quite working, but I'll give you So let's... Uh, Let's go. Just this gentleman here first, and then uh, then the gentleman behind. It's such a great talk. It's so good to hear from you. Uh, my name is Rahala. I'm from Afghanistan. Um, I belong to the Hazara ethnic group. I came here on a humanitarian program. Uh, the Americans, the Australians, and the Dutch, um, the Britons, they're all concentrated on the Pashtun population. Uh, in Kandahar, in Helmand, in Uruzgan, they're all populated by the Pashtuns. You built a school, and the Taliban came and destroyed it. And uh, the Americans built again, the Britons, the Australians. And the Taliban came again and destroyed it. At the end of the day, Pashtuns have, pro proved, have proven such an unfaithful partner in Afghanistan. And while you guys have totally overlooked my people, the Hazaras of in Afghanistan, um, we could have been a great partner because the Hazaras are very secular. Um, the schools, despite receiving nothing from you guys, uh, schools have flourished. Um, more uh, graduates, more graduates from high school come out of high school in Hazarajal in my area than any other uh, places uh, in fashion area. So my question is, why did you? Uh, not only Australia, but the Americans and the Britons overlooked Hazaras, uh, whereas Hazaras could have been a great partner uh, in building democracy and building education and basically everything in Afghanistan. Yeah, well, that's, that's a very good point. Um, as you might be aware, uh, Hazaras are 10, 12% of the population? 25%. Uh, that's 
You might have posed that from questions. <laughs> So you get a sense of the dynamics here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, That's the problem. Yeah. When you go to Afghanistan, you're totally cocooned by Pashtuns. Mm. You're received by Pashtuns. You're yeah. introduced to Afghanistan by Pashtuns. You live in the guest house that's built by Pashtuns. So I don't blame you for your perception of this. No, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, the, there is ongoing tension. But Hazaras are concentrated in the, around the middle of Afghanistan in, in what they call the Hazarajat. Um, and um, there is long-standing tension. Uruzgan was a Hazara province 120 years ago, um, but it was displaced by Pashtuns. Uh, when I say displaced, that's a nice word for what happened. Um, driven towards the middle of Afghanistan, um, uh, and, uh, and the relationship between Pashtuns and Hazaras is not good, and part of the problem for the Pashtuns is that Hazarans keep topping the schools. Uh, you know, every 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 academic records from the end of every school year show Hazaras at the top of the roster, uh, and that's um, you know that sort of behaviour is not welcome in any culture. Um, <laughs> but um, your, your, your your basic question is an important one. You know, ISAF invested heavily in in the south, in the Pashtun areas where the problems were, um, uh, particularly Helmand Province, for example. Uh, you know, there were. 10, 20,000 Marines went into Helmand Province for a period there and, and, and had a hell of a hard time. Uh, I'm not sure. We tended to go where the... And, of course, the, 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 the Taliban is seen as uh, a kind of extension of Pashtun nationalism. Uh, their constituency is amongst the Pashtuns um, and, and they are seen as, as, as an expression of that Pashtun nationalism. And so they get no support in Hazara there is. I think there was a tendency for, for ISAF to concentrate both the, concentrate the military where we perceived the enemy to be. Uh, so, for example, I, and I remember when we were going into Helmand in that big way, what sprung to mind for me was the statement by a, a Pink Floyd manager, Peter Jenner, who once said uh, his, his strategy on touring Pink Floyd was, go where the love is. The love was not in Helmand. Uh, the love would have been in the middle of the country. Um, so, in a sense, the, our approach was to attack the enemy rather than support strength. So, you, you know, you have a very good point. Perhaps we would have made it would have been better to have tried to support positive things rather than address the enemy who we perceived to be in that Pashtun area. Um, um, and uh, and I guess that's my answer. Is you, you, you could be right. Um, I'm quoting from your songs, the Minister for Education can't read or write and the Minister for Women runs a knock shop in the night. I'm just wondering if that was still the case later on. No, we replaced that education, Minister. Oh, good to hear. <laughs> That's a part of what we but did. More so this, is, this is one of the interesting things about how we worked uh, as between, you know, that was Dutch reporting and, and it could have been circular reporting. There's a thing in the intelligence world called circular reporting where someone says something over dinner and someone else reports and it becomes fact. I think it might have been the case, but um, one of the things we did there was identify malign people within the provincial government and then through our embassies and the Dutch embassies in Kabul lobby to have them replaced and we, we did that with that particular education minister and got a much more productive one. Um, and the ministers varied. Some of them were great, some were lesser. Was there an improvement standard overall, or was it just a matter of Well, it was one, two steps forward, one back, or, you know, a, this is the thing about, uh, you know, a country like Afghanistan. It's, it's very personality based. Here we have ministries, and those ministries have depth and <coughs> procedure and all that thing. But in Afghanistan, it comes down to personalities. It's very much like Melanesia, big man culture. Uh, and a lot depends on the talent and uh, and um, disposition of, of the individuals you get in those positions, and 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 there's a rotating. Uh, the health the health minister in Uruzgan was fantastic guy, Miyakul. You saw him. Uh, roads and rehabilitation, Hashim, fantastic, got things done. Others problematic, and we had to work around them and and keep their fingers off our. Uh... <laughs> Excuse me, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, Douglas Robertson, director of research services at ANU. Um, you made an interesting comment that one bomb in Kabul is worth two in the provinces, and I just wonder what your reflections on the Australian 
press and their recording and their reporting of Afghanistan during the period you were there was? Uh, I, th I think it was mixed. Um, uh, we have some. We have Nick Stewart here, for example. Yeah, good to see you. Who, who, who um, wrote an article recently on on our relationship with Matula. Uh, I disagreed with him on some points, and I, but I agreed with him on others. You know, uh, it was. You know, you had a whole spectrum of reporters from uh, some who could be quite antagonistic and identify uh, problems to some who, like Hugh Rimington, who could be quite sympathetic and respected confidences. And I thought. Um, told a pretty fair story. Uh, I think that the Australian Defence Forces were pretty good at um, getting embeds in. Uh, a whole lot of them did that, from from Hugh to Chris Masters to Ian McFedrin, uh, and there might have been half a dozen others who came, went out to the forward operating bases, stayed, and reported and said whatever they wanted, as long as it didn't transgress operational security. So I think we did that quite actively. Uh, we gave them an ability to say whatever they wanted. But having said that, you know, having toured this show and this album around Australia, what Australians tell me is that they never really understood the thing. They feel as though it hadn't been adequately explained to them. And now I think that's got a bit to do with the media cycles. You know, most of what breaks the news is 30 seconds of footage every time there's a ramp ceremony, from which Australians think, oh, God, it's just horrible there. What are we doing? What's the point? This is, not, this is going nowhere. I don't think the current media cycle lends itself to a more sophisticated pre presentation, and in part that's what I hope this book will do, to give people a more three-dimensional sense of what it's like. You know, it was tough, uh, it was a tricky, opaque environment, but we got a bit done, and uh, you know, there were some tough times, a lot of grief, but we had a bit of fun too. I wanted to show that human side to it, and I wanted to show the human side to the Afghans because uh, they're fascinating and interesting people. Yeah. Um Australian politicians in particular, and I suspect it's pretty broad, are very good at having photo opportunities for opening something, like a toilet block. But they're very poor at making sure that there's always toilet paper there. How do we make sure that all the things that were done, blood, sweat and tears in some cases, that the schools are safe and resourced for the kids to go to? that the health clinics are safe places to go to and people get help there. Otherwise, um, the resources really weren't worth putting there in the first place. We have to keep it up in, in the future, surely. Oh, Arthur Davies. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, you know, and, uh, and you know, this is why it's important to have DFAT slash Ausaid as it was at the time working in these places because, uh, uh, you know, we had our engineers there and they would build things and they're good at stuff. They build things to a higher standard than uh, most Afghans are accustomed to. Uh, most of the stuff we built uh, was pretty useful and endured, like the roads, but there were projects that other countries did which definitely became white elephants. Uh, schools that were unused, aid clinics unused. It happens. And, and one of the things is that the, the, the people, that, you know, the military tends to work on an eight-month cycle. They go in for eight months and they leave. Uh, whereas development agencies are accustomed to the long cycle work of sustaining these things. But of course, sustaining these things involves a whole lot of system through government. Uh, and that kind of system is the work of generations. Uh, now, we understand all this. Um, and one of the, you know, this is one of the interesting things about our development in Uruzgan. We, we got in there and we did it for four years. AusAid was there for four years. And that's a, that's a really short horizon for development actors. And so one of the lessons we learned from this is that, you know, when our soldiers go in, our diplomats and aid workers should go in to get the opportunity to work in that long cycle way. And, yeah, but you're right, though. There was, there was tension between the short term and the long term. And uh, we, we recognised it was a problem. And, we do what it could, but it's long cycle work of generations. Now, we want to hear a couple of songs from Fred, so we have a last question. Well, my name is Ayaz. I'm particularly interested to your talks because I'm coming from a place very close to Oregon that you have been here. That is, uh, mm, it's related to you know, Ghazni province, but it is very close in, in daily communication with uh, Oregon. Coming from Malistan, uh, 
the complexity is that you mentioned it is uh, it's very understand understandable for us working with local commanders working with the uh, uh, local leaders it's very difficult and you have done it uh, with uh, uh, a great job the question is that uh, for some of these uh, local commanders that you already mentioned for example Matteo Lohan uh, it's believed that he got his power, his influence, his uh, his money from foreigners, from NATO troops, from um, the uh, from the contracts that he had with the NATO. He, he he was supplying the services, he was supplying the security for for NATO convoys, and he he got the uh, the money for that. And later he he became a problem. At, at the local level. So uh, don't you think that uh, uh, dealing with the local uh, influential people from uh, international community, from ISAF, it is also a part of problem that is uh, this creating a still problem there. That, uh, they are feeding and they are, uh, they are sourcing the local influential that they are, they are um, uh, uh, are very, sometimes they are playing negatively there. No, that's absolutely uh, an important perspective. Um, uh, I guess there's, there's probably four things I'd say. The first is that, you know, in that power vacuum that was Afghanistan in 2002, we know, you know, Taliban, one government falls, you're never going to get the other one out. In that power vacuum, you will always get warlords emerging. Uh, the second thing I'd say is you're absolutely right. There's probably an extent to which our involvement there and our money made the situation worse. The clever warlords figured out how to tap into us and make money from us. Um, I, I said before that you know the golden rule is we are a source of power resources in their disputes with one another. Now Machula played that game very well. He uh, when he set up his home, he built it right on the outskirts <laughs> of our base. He had uh, a monopoly, he, he had a, a Kandak that was in charge of road security, and he basically worked that like the M5 tollway. Uh, you know, if, if you wanted to use his road to resupply, you had to give him money. And so he became very wealthy as a result. Uh, so obviously, thirdly, and that's a problem because uh, all Matula's friends would be happy with that, but his enemies would not. In, in a competitive zero-sum culture, uh, one person gets rich and another doesn't, the other becomes your enemy. You only need two, two, two three, four percent of the population to have a decent insurgency. We needed to do that better and we need to think about these things in future. Um, but in, in the end, you know, this all happened. Matula rose to power before Australia became a player on the base. We were bit players. And so the situation we inherited in 2010, by that point, the horse had bolted. We had to deal with him as he was. Uh, and at that point, you know, we could have fought against him. The Brits tried to do that in Helmand and got their asses kicked. Uh, we had to work with him. And in the end, he was seen as quite constructive, including people from, from by people from the Gilzai tribe who, who found him useful. So, you know, we handled that as best as we could, we Australia, but as a general principle, the international community uh, needed to be far more astute about the way that warlords work and operate. Uh, your point is a good one. Now, um, it's been fantastic hearing what you've had to say, Fred, uh, but we know you've got other talents, and uh, people have come uh, here, I think, with an expectation that they might get a ballot or two, uh, Let's go with one. <laughs> <laughs> it's nearly dinner time, I think. And we've got, we've got uh, drinks and nibblies and signings out, outside afterwards as well. So uh, something that will uh, get us ready for that. But I'll hand over to you now. I was going to talk about warlord management and these sorts of questions. Um, <laughs> but I, I, thought, I suppose I'll offer a final, final reflection on... Uh, Final reflection on coalition missions. No, th these missions that we get involved in, these stabilisation missions, and we will need to do them in the future because uh, you know the problems that brew in these countries become ours. But 
We will never do them unilaterally because when you go into another country unilaterally, it starts to look like an invasion. And there are lots of advantages to working in these coalitions, of course. You get more resources, different perspectives, uh, but it's not without its complexities, as I've sort of highlighted today. I mean, we worked there very closely with the Dutch for four or five years, and generally speaking, we got on very well with the Dutch. Um, but there were a couple of cultural problems that caused issues for the diggers. Uh, one was the fierce proclivity of the Dutchmen for wearing lycra. <laughs> you couldn't stop them. And the other, of course, was a Dutch cultural practice known as swaffling. I'd never heard of swaffling before I went over there. Uh, but I showed up and one of the diggers came up to me and said, Hey, Fred, you've got to do something about those bloody Dutchies. They keep swaffling in the Dixies. I said, no worries, I'll get right onto it. <laughs> well, I didn't know what it meant. So I asked one of my counterparts, a Dutch diplomat called Alex Oosterwick, I said, Alex, what's this swaffling business? He said, oh, it's a Dutch cultural practice. I said, really, what does it mean? He said, oh, it just means to swing your penis backwards and forwards and bump it up against something. <laughs> I said, uh, is this popular in Holland? <laughs> He said, um, more so amongst the men than the women. <laughs> I said, how did it become so popular? He said, well, it became very popular through YouTube. You see, two Dutch tourists film one another swaffling the Taj Mahal. <laughs> Footage of this went onto YouTube, went viral, and started a whole craze of Dutch tourists passing around the world, you know, swaffling national monuments. The Sphinx and the Eiffel Tower and the Washington Monument. And I said to Alex, how do you know about this? He said, well, I was working in the, in the High Commission in, uh, in Delhi, and my, uh, my, my ambassador was, um, uh, he was uh, called in to explain to the Indian Foreign Ministry the swaffling business. <laughs> and my friend Alex had to write the talking points. You know. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of work we do at diplomatic posts. <laughs> but anyway, we, you know, we had a more a problem, immediate problem on the base in so far as the Dutch soldiers were swaffling in the Dixies. Now the Dixies were the blue plastic portalies that proliferated around the base. And of course for the Australian soldiers, these were, these were this is the dunny. This is sacred space. This is where your Australian soldier writes his best poetry. <laughs> so, you know, the future of Australian war poetry was at stake. <laughs> I had to do something about it, and I wrote the following song <laughs> called Knit Swaffling Up the Dixie. Sing along. <laughs> I'd heard that when the Taliban held power in Kabul. They messed up people's lives with lots of silly rules. Women were illegal, and so was flying kites. And God defend the kind of men who like to dress in tights. I wouldn't want to be like the Taliban and tell you what to do. I'm fighting here for freedom after all, just like you. I respect your lowlands culture and I love you very much. But there is one important thing I say to all you Dutch. Nip, swaffling up the Dixie. It's against the law. Nip, swaffling up the Dixie. We're trying to fight a war. And if you're swaffling in that Dixie like a Dixie swaffling man, how the hell are we supposed to defeat the Taliban? So nip, swaffling up the Dixie. Nip, nip, nip. Nip, swaffling up the Dixie. There isn't enough room. If I hear that you've been swaffling in that Dixie, I'll tell Brigadier Van Oom. And he'll have you court-martialed and sent back to The Hague, where they'll put your dick on a table and whack it with a spade. So hit it, swaffling up the Dixie. Nip, 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 swaffling up the Dixie. It really isn't fair. Uh, there are people who need to use that Dixie and you could swaffle anywhere. You could swaffle in Paris, you could swaffle in Rome, you could swaffle in the Taj Mahal or wait till you get home. You could swaffle in the shower block with shampoo or soapy. You could swaffle with the RSM or with the fucking Pope button. Nip, swaffling on the Dixie. Nip, nip, nip. Nip, swaffling up the Dixie. Did you hear me? Or are you deaf? If I find that you've been swaffling in that Dixie, I will call in the SF. 
Task Force 55 and the boys from 66 go swaffling at night with black paint on their dicks and if they will find you swaffling in that Dixie my friend they'll have knocked on the Dixie door in which case I would recommend that you immediately bend over place your chest upon your thighs stick your head between your knees and kiss your ass goodbye so nip swaffling up the Dixie nip 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 I mean, there were very different cultures there. I remember <laughs> working on the base there. We, we had two barbers on the base, you know, and we had an Australian one who worked in the, uh, in the laundry there, and uh, we called him two, because you sit down the chair, and his only English was one or two, and you'd say one or two. It was the only haircut he could do, too, so, you know. <laughs> and then there was, of course, the Dutch barber who could do anything you wanted, you know, really nice coiffures like mine. Um, um, but there was a price to say, pay for this, which is to say the, di the diggers didn't call him Dick on Nam for nothing. It is to say his sense of personal space was different from what Australian songs are. <laughs> he used to. Um, Need swaffling up the Dixie. Listen well to this. There are lots of people here on Camp Holland that you could swaffle with. You could swaffle with the Slovaks down at the Slovak gate. You could swaffle with the Aussies, but be sure to call them mate. You could swaffle with the cook. You could swaffle with two. You could swaffle him with Dick and Arm if he doesn't swaffle you. But he hit swaffle up the Dick and Arm. Hit, 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 hit. Swaffling up the Dixie. It really is quite gross. Sorry, this is a bit un... un <laughs> um, once a week they clean those Dixies with a great big vacuum hose. And if you're swaffling in that Dixie on a lazy Saturday, you may find yourself fellatioed in the most unpleasant way. It'll grab you, it'll suck until there is nothing left. What's the BDA, that's the Battle Damage Assessment, gonna say about your cause of death that you died swaffling in the Dixie? Nip, nip. Sing along now. Anyway, the Dutch, um, as I said, they withdrew from the Lisgan province, and, and that was a source of great sorrow to Dutch soldiers. Uh, this was an interesting thing. Uh, they felt their political masters had let them down in a sense, and. Uh, you know, they've lost 26 men there, and it's quite a lot. And, I mean, one question was, you know, we do develop these emotional political equities. Uh, I mean, I did an economics degree here at the ANU. The economists down there, down the road, would call that a sunk cost. But, it, you know, the political equities is real. Yeah, you want them, sorry. Uh, but so, yeah, the, the Dutch were very sorry to be leaving. And in case, it was a very tough summer that summer. Bloody hot, and a thousand Americans were coming in, and... TV screens going, and a thousand Dutchmen came in to pull out the other two thousand <coughs> Dutchmen, and the lines of the mess along, and the Dixies were chocolate. But then, to make things worse for the Dutch, they lost the World Cup soccer final. This was 2010, of course, and uh, they got into the final. And the, the Dutch take soccer a bit seriously, uh, so they weren't, very, you know, they weren't in a good state by July. And so I decided to put in a concert to cheer them up, and I wrote this last verse just to thank the Dutch for their contribution to the province. Um, I should say, I'll be playing more of these songs. Uh. <laughs> um, come and buy a book. Um, if you want a book, they're 30 bucks. If you want a book and a CD, it's 50 bucks. Anyway, so this is the song, the verse I wrote for them. Uh. Well, Dutch friends, I've heard your lead. I know you've made this plan. Because swaffling's become illegal. Here in Uruzgan. But when you're back in Holland, you can swaffle what you like. You can swaffle in a windmill. You can swaffle in a dike. You can swaffle in a hash pipe. In Leiden or Cholain, but you can't swaffle the World Cup because the fucking thing's in Spain. So let's <laughs> 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 <laughs>